Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon Listeners. Chico and the Man will not be presented this evening, and the Rockford Files will be seen one hour later than normal, so that we may bring you the following special program. Welcome back, everybody. Time again for Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. On Suntris here, I am really happy to welcome Mark Russell back to Word Balloon. I think Mark, in a lot of ways, single-handedly, very uh, very slowly, was uh, kind of creeping into the comics community with a lot of really funny books. And now, as we were saying uh, before we started recording, Mark, you're all over the place with some top-notch books from, one of the, some, from really all the top uh, publishers. So welcome back. Well, thanks. Yeah, I feel like uh, a lot of the stuff I've done over the last year is finally getting out. So it, it seems like I'm busier than I am, but I am pretty busy. Well, that's great. That only means more stuff is coming. So that's, yes. that's terrific. I mean, last time we talked, we talked about the beginning of Not All Robots, and you're a couple issues into that at AWA, uh, which is a great uh, look at maybe where we're going in uh, 50 years, or maybe 25 years, I suppose. I always forget where we are in the... Uh, in the calendar, it's still, you know, it's not 2000 anymore. It's around the 2050s that the story. Yeah, as a rule of thumb, uh, whenever you're predicting a, a negative dystopia, whatever you think, whenever you think it's going to happen, subtract 20 years. It's going to be sooner than you think. Probably. And it really, with the way apps are going and things like that, and even robots and stuff, the Roomba is trying to kill me. Uh, might be the subtitle of this uh, great uh, miniseries that you got going today. Is it a miniseries? Is it an ongoing, uh, Mark? Well, it started as a miniseries. I wrote it for five issues, but we're actually approved for a, a second season. So I guess it's still a limited series, just less limited than it was when it started. Now it's a maxi series. Yeah. All right. You know, I mean, that's, you know, usually that's it's the goal. The goal is to become a maxi series. I, I love it. I think that sounds great, man. And no, it's incredibly funny uh, and very, very cynical. Both on the humans part and the robots part, but uh, that's terrific. That's what makes it a really fun, uh, fun series. It's been great, and really, um, actually, I, I was just telling you, you know, uh, Emerald City and, and C2E2 this weekend. I did a panel with AWA for a new book that they're launching, and um, it's a pre-recorded panel that I did, um, and it's on the uh, Emerald City site already, and it'll already be on the C2E2 site for this weekend coming up. So, looking forward to that. Add Axel on. And uh, yeah, no, I would, I've told him and I've told Lisa, Lisa Wu a, a million times. It's like, I love the, their, um, their editorial taste that they're letting people like yourself make these really cool comics. 
yeah, one of the reasons why I wanted to do this with AWA is because I I love all their titles. They're they're very well curated. They do a really good job of picking. And I think that when you're looking for a a, a place to take your creator own title, a good idea is to find a place that people will read something just based upon the the company that's putting out, like AWA or Vault or Ahoy. I think one of the advantages of going with one of the smaller creator owned companies like that is that they get a reputation and people will check things out. They normally wouldn't have be just because they they've had such good experiences reading other titles by, by those companies. Absolutely, man. No, definitely. And we'll talk about your, uh, your vault and Ahoy comics in a second, but another comic that uh, dropped this week, and right there it is one star squadron. Uh, hilarious again. And this is like not only a Justice League parody, but it, it almost feels like um, was it uh, Heroes for Hi kind of a Heroes for Hire, like a DC version of Heroes for Hire in a lot of ways. Well, and yeah, it's sort of it, it's it's very much like uh, what one, one of the things I one of the problems I always have with when I'm reading superhero comics is that the scale is just kind of not right. Like you have these characters and they're always sol saving the world or the galaxy every week. It's like, how, how many times can you really do that? So I wanted to tell a, a story that had more of a human scale. It was more about people worrying about losing their jobs or, or uh, uh, you know, like, like helping somebody find an apartment. I want to do a superhero about things like that because I just feel like the scale makes it like not only sort of a newer story that people maybe aren't used to reading in superhero comics, but also more relatable. And, and um it's, I mean, really, especially this first issue, and I don't know if that's going to be the the tone of the whole, this is another mini series uh, moving forward, but uh, it is bittersweet because um, as much as you're making fun of various heroes, there's also kind of a, a tragic story. And I'm a big uh, Superman reader. And uh, I, do we, do we reveal who uh, the, the, the subplot is? It's up to you, Mark. I don't want to, I don't want to. Yeah, wanna... that's fine. If you want to talk okay. about it. Yeah. Crime Buster, man. Uh, Jose. Crime Gangbuster, excuse yeah. me. Crimebuster is the old 50s character from the Le Le uh, Le Le Lev Gleason uh, books and stuff. Gangbuster, yeah. absolutely. Who even had a relationship with Lois Lane for a while. And um, God, this is such a tragic story because he's kind of having uh, P uh, PTSD kind of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, conditions and is very monosyllabic in the story. And uh, yeah, that's really that's really sad, man. Um, you know, and well, also he went from being a boxer to being a hero. So, I mean, he's got to have taken like his fair amount of like head trauma and it, it largely is about how, you know, in his case, it's sort of a parallel for professional sports. Uh, but in general, it's about how office work sort of chews you up and spits you out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's the nature of the workplace is that you're only valuable to them to the extent you're productive. And then once you're not, it's like you're you're utterly replaceable. So all this you know stuff about oh we're a family here or oh we look after it's not really true because as soon as you can't uh, as soon as you you're not economically useful to them you're 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 discarded. You're cut loose. Yeah. What's yeah, so what's the name What's the name of your uh, your company for these heroes again? Oh, uh, heroes for you. Heroes for you. With a Z for heroes. Yeah, and, it's and it's a totally hip you. economy you know app. Yeah. Heroes with the Z number four letter U. You. Yeah. <laughs> and here's a here's a good shot of uh, a lot of the group here. Um, so there's there's Plastic Man and Red Tornado. Red Tornado basically kind of uh, uh, the the office uh, manager essentially and stuff. Yeah. Um, who who is that next to Red Tornado? Uh, that's Flying Fox. Oh sure, absolutely from uh, from uh, Global Guardians, right? Uh huh. Absolutely, Power Girl right there. GI Robot, great, great scene of GI Robot at a birthday party. Uh, fantastic. I don't know who that is next to GI Robot in the background. That's yeah. Folded Man. Folded Man, two, two dimensional superhero. <laughs> and I'm forgetting now. There's the heckler at the end, but who's that in the middle again? That's Minute Man, and he's Minute actually Man. a guy I I made up for the series. Oh. Uh, although I was told by DC that there actually was a Minute Man. It, this is a completely different guy. Okay, because, yeah, I thought I, I was going to say, like, I want to say, like, a Fawcett original character, Minuteman, back in the day. Yeah, it's the different guy. Um, yeah. I wanted, it, I came up with Minuteman because I wanted to use Our Man, and they said no. 
because I'd really, really kind of <laughs> come up with a story about our man uh, and is like, you know, need to like you have these expensive Miraclo pills in order to work. And they said, no, uh, our man's unavailable. He's, he's doing something else. He's otherwise, you know, indisposed. <laughs> But I really wanted to keep that storyline, which I felt was in a lot of ways kind of the heart of the series. So I, I just created my own hero, Minuteman, which in a way is even more pathetic. Indeed. Absolutely. <laughs> Doesn't even get an hour. Gets a minute. That's excellent, man. No, it's it's really it's terrific and and really very sweet. And and again, there's the uh, the the uh, gangbuster story. Uh, not a, not a funny story. It's kind of sad. Really sad. Yeah, so, well, you know, it's an office comedy, and office comedies, I think, are inherently tragic because they're about people having to do things for money they they never expected or wanted to do. So soul really crushing is, experience. Yeah, Absolutely. really, every every office comedy is about people's dreams being broken in two. Yeah, you're right. Uh, head office, office space. I mean, all that stuff, man. No, I, and uh, certainly, you know, we're close enough in age. You've you've experienced those same '80s movies. Well before uh, what we get right. now, even on t- you know, and certainly on TV with things like The Office and things. So mm-hmm. yeah, pretty pretty amazing. Oh, that's a nice compliment from uh, Jared. Great first issue, Giffen and De- uh, Demetrius and McGuire. Oh. Watch out! Yeah, I'll take that comparison. That's very good company. Thank you, Jared. Hell yeah! Uh, thank you, Salah and Casey. Thank Indeed. you all for everyone who's showing up in the comments. Yeah, no, it's really it's it's so much it's so much fun and it's great. The last time. We really saw Red Tornado with great prominence was when Brad Meltzer put him in those great Justice League uh, stories from like 15 years ago. Yeah. So, you know, and I love, you know, again, (laughs) you get very meta and he has a great Justice League flashback. But yeah, even, I mean, even an android like Red Tornado sadly gets, uh, you know, stuck in the grind of office work and everything too. Yeah. And one of the things I like about Red Tornado's storyline is that he's a, he, he wants to sort of be a normal guy. He's maybe the one person who really looks forward to working in the office because he wants to be, learn what it is to be human. And he thinks this is what humans do. Humans work sort of vaguely <laughs> unfulfilling jobs. Yeah. In offices, but he has this really sort of touching approach to it where he, he honestly believes perhaps naively that he's there to help people. That he's there to help manage things and 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 help his employees, you know, in anything they need. And so he's sort of, I think, his naive sort of vision of what humans should be is actually a lot better than than what we as jaded people who've been around the block a few times understand it to be. Uh, the heckler kind is that like a Glenn Gary Glenn Ross kind of salesman uh, sort of situation. Yeah, it's funny you should say that because it does come up later where like uh, Plastic Man's like listening to them talking. He's like, wait, is this a coffee for closer speech? And he starts riffing on Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross in the middle of like Red Tornado's speech to the office. Uh, but yeah, the, the the whole sales team has got that sort of vibe where, you know, uh, uh, Levine the machine is, I guess, GI robot. And, and, and yeah, it's like a bit sort of a sales competition between, uh, between GI robot and uh, the heckler. And they're always like topping each other. And Flying Fox is just like just like falling through every net, and he can't sell to save his life. And he's really nervous that he's going to get fired. That's excellent. That's amazing. I don't know. Do you want to reveal other motivations? Why, uh, Power Power Girl? Obviously, something's going on at the end of uh, the first. Yeah, movie. Power Girl has gotten a hold of some really toxic ideas, and it will be revealed. Like in I think issue number two, she starts talking. No, I think even in issue one, she started talking about this about Maxwell Lord's book that she's been reading. Never a good idea. And, and there's scenes <laughs> later in the series where she's like listening to it on uh, on audiobook, like in her SUV. And he's making some really bad, but sort of convincing points. And and for a while, she kind of falls for it. That's awesome. Now, it's funny because you mentioned you wanted to use um, uh, uh, Our Man. And we're told, no, Bruce wants to know if you could speak more on the process of requesting characters to use for an ensemble comic like this. And he's really looking forward to reading the series. You won't Yeah, be um, my criterion for selecting characters was, number one, they had to be available uh as you know they say in like the nfl the best ability is availability uh and also i wanted them to be sort of pathetic sort of really b-list maybe c-list characters uh probably the most high profile characters that i was able to like include were power girl and um and uh plastic man and they're sort of like kind of seen as the winners in the group uh and then also i wanted characters that had a really good look 
that just sort of looked kind of iconic. I didn't want, you know, five characters who all kind of look the same. I wanted them to be sort of radically different backgrounds of superhero. Like you can see, we've got an Android, we've got like a, a man animal hybrid. We got a two dimensional guy. And of course the heckler is just a guy who decided to put on a mask. Yeah. <laughs> well, also, and I'm, I'm assuming that Bruce also wonders, Maybe on the corporate side, like, and again, I don't want I don't want you to necessarily give away corporate secrets, but um, could you reveal other other heroes that you uh, wanted to get? And they said no, and you don't tell us why they said no, but uh, well, the, yeah, there was our man, and that was the that was the biggest one, the biggest crush to my would have would mind. it have been Rex or uh, Rick? Um, Rick, Rick, okay, uh, the son, yeah, it, 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 I I can't remember any others that were like just outright no. There are a couple that make sort of minor appearances in the series later on, like Manhunter comes up later which on. Which man? Uh, and I don't, unless you don't want to spoil which Manhunter, you know, uh, which Manhunter is coming up. I'll, I'll leave. I'll leave it to the viewers' surprise. I got to leave some great. surprises. Totally fine, yeah. man. Absolutely. No, no, no. That's that's great, and it's great to hear. I mean, that was my hope that there are going to be more uh, C level and maybe, you know, a D level, uh, characters. Yeah. And again, that's the great thing about both companies, DC and Marvel. They've tried so many times over the years with really interesting ideas. And, um, yeah. And also this must be a great opportunity to maintain trademarks for some of these characters truly in a, in a crass way. I'm, yeah. I'm, I don't know if DC looked at it that way as well, because so you're saying this is like my Roger Corman, fantastic four movie. <laughs> Well, that's the worst case scenario. But no, you know, like even when the new 52 happened, there were a lot of one shots that came out. Yeah. And I'm sure you know that. And for the listeners and, and viewers, you know that, um, no, they just every now and then you got to refresh the trademark and put out something new. I forget for All-Star Squadron. Oh, I believe it was the Guardian, the blue and, and gold Guardian. They're like, put Guardian on the cover of All-Star Squadron. And it's like, but we really don't have anything with him in the story. Yeah, but we need to maintain the trademark, so just throw him on the cover. And it's yeah. like, all right. Yeah. I, I didn't do anything that cynical. Um, but <laughs> one of the things that sort of attracts me to using, you know, really minor characters is that the farther you get away from the crown jewels, away from Batman and Superman, the more chances you can take, the more they're willing to sort of put up with and let you do with these characters and so that was one thing that really appealed to me about being able to tell a story about sure you know, hitherto very minor characters is that you know the stakes can be permanent because these are characters that the company isn't necessarily worried about their their continuity or their their sales and other titles absolutely which are for the most part non-existent um bruce wants to know and i and i don't know this either where did where uh where was folded man's last appearance oh man i wish i knew i couldn't tell you i had to go to the dark corners of the internet to find folded man but once i saw him i was like oh this guy's gotta be in there's a guy that uh, made a couple books of just looking through from the golden age to the modern age the weirdest heroes and villains ever and i and shame i on probably found him on one of those lists like, Shame on me for not remembering like his one name. of these like 10 heroes who should never have been made lists. Those, <laughs> like, yes, he's mine. <laughs> well, even um God on uh, on uh, uh public radio, uh microface, uh they they you know they dug up microface because uh the show Planet Money wanted to um see what what all the machinations are behind having a superhero property how you can exploit it, you know, television, movies, whatever. And they had to find a public domain hero. And Microface was literally this hero whose face was a microphone. And, you know. Yeah. yeah. I scary. mean, to me, it's like the, 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 the obvious, you know, source of revenue, uh, you know, passive revenue for these characters is like um, endorsements. Like microface should be like endorsing microphones. It should be We're, like a microphone. By yeah. the way, that's awesome in terms of, uh, Black Condor essentially having a cameo account. Yeah. Uh, brilliant. Brilliant. You got to do what you got to do. Uh, <laughs> I got the idea for that because a, a friend of mine um, got Flavor Flav to, to leave a uh, a cameo video, which he recorded under dubious sobriety uh, to him. I was like, oh, that'd be cool if the, the heroes had to do that. I, I, I You know, I'm going to have to show this for a second, Mark. Uh, one of the podcasts that I do are with uh, – the, the guys behind Tiny Titans and uh, various uh, DC funny books, but also their own funny books. And that's 
uh, the Oh Yeah Comics guys. And uh, we had a, this guy uh, make one for our podcast. Hi, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Podcast host. This is Jamie Farr from the TV series MASH. And, and, uh, oh, and my this, God. Dude, I don't make me play Clear. the whole thing. The great thing is, because we knew... We knew that, you know, obviously on MASH Radar, you know, loved uh, comics. Sometimes he'd fall asleep with a comic on his chest or whatever. And I don't know how we lucked out. But we're like, uh, do you or does Klinger have any fa favorite comic heroes? Jamie Farr, massive comic book fan, grew up during the Golden Age, at one point holds up the Jules Pfeiffer comic book heroes book and literally is name checking. Oh, everybody's in here like Hawkman and the Spectre. So he's going deep. And we were just yeah. delighted. And literally, the guy went on for like three minutes talking about his own personal love of comics. So sometimes the whole those side of Klinger you didn't know existed. <laughs> so no, and it's so funny because the other hosts are like, "All right, we got to get another." And I'm like, "Okay, let's see the stars align where we're going to get a celebrity who's really jazzed up about talking about his comic books and stuff." I'm like, "I, I, I we'll see. I, you know, I, I've yet to find another guy." that will be so earnest in his love for comics and really just did that all on his own. And I was, so yeah, I hear you. Flavor Flav. Good Lord. That's awesome. Jesus Christ. All right. More comments. Let's see what we got here. Um, regarding power girl, uh, her Max Lord inspiration. I assumed he never killed uh, Ted Cord in this current continuity. I have a single rule about writing is that I, I tend to ignore everything that came before. So I don't worry about continuity. I mean, it's possible. I mean, I guess it would make sense that he hadn't killed him, but that's not something I worry about because I, my opinion, continuity just sort of gets in the way of telling the story you want to tell. So I, I didn't worry about any of that stuff. But you've uh, also found inspiration from old stories. Yeah. Like, I mean, your your future tense uh, Superman and Luther story where they're on Lux uh, Lexor and everything. Yeah. If there's something that's good in continuity that helps the story, take it by all means but if it's you know complicating or you feel like you're having to sort of explain away details or put in lines that don't fit in the story but that like sort of explain how this fits in continuity to me that's that's you know that's putting you know that's that's throwing out the baby with the bathwater. it's like the story should always come first understood man well again great debut this week for one star squadron thank uh, you absolutely man and then of course uh we have um my bad and now that's the second issue that came out this week. I believe here. Is this the first issue? Yes. yes. So hilarious. Fantastic look. I mean, it looks like, you know, Silver Age and Bronze Age uh, parodies of, of superhero stuff. And uh, your incredible main character, the Chandelier. Uh, yeah. Chandelier Not Chandelier at Chandelier all Harry. related to Batman, but, you know, his no, parents, no, no. he is the heir to a, a lamp fortune. Uh, and so he became the Chandelier. And yet nobody seems to figure out that the lamp air guy is the chandelier, the guy with all these lamp based accessories. Uh, it's yeah. I, I love the series because it allows me to use a lot of like ideas that were too out there for, you know, big two comics. And also because it allows me to work with uh, my longtime friend, Bryce Ingman, who co-writes the series with me. Yeah. Who, especially the guy who introduced me to comic books in college. Oh, wow. And much more knowledgeable about it than I am. Uh, and he writes the the other half of the story about Emperor King, so uh, yeah, really, a really great time writing. It's it's really liberating because it's I don't have to worry about like uh, any sort of continuity or you know editors saying you can't get away with that. It's basically a free for all, and it's it's largely just about their petty egos about how both heroes and villains are kind of driven by their own vanity. <laughs> it's outstanding, man! Hilarious and. Uh, here's another great panel of uh, sh the chandelier. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he has an expensive face. <laughs> now, and forgive me, and, I, and if it comes in the story, shame on me. But will he ever be like tripped up by the fact that he's got the little, you know, uh, crystals and that the, the the constant tinkling as he might be trying to creep up? On oh, something? that's a good idea. I wish I thought of that, but no. <laughs> um, uh, the the big liability the crystals pose for him in my series is, as you just saw. It makes him a very inviting target, and yeah. uh, in, in one punch to the face, one successful punch that connects, and the chandelier helmet is pretty much gone. <laughs> and it's not um, very protective. It's not the best idea for protective gear. 
Well, again, not only not only great stories, but uh, did I put did I put up the? Uh, oh, I, I love the uh, the comment. It's very very Sia. It's very it's very what? Sia, you know, she always oh. wears like those oh, masks yeah. and wigs and stuff. Yes, of course. Face. Shame on me, absolutely. And uh, yeah, and uh, he loves the uh, Psycho Man uh, visual reference. Um, yeah, yeah I, that's I, totally I, Peter Krause. Well, yeah, and, and that's the great thing is Krause and who's the other artist that's doing it? Uh, Peter Krause is the the artist. Um, that's and, for your stuff, uh, right? Right. Uh, and and Bryce Ingman is the other writer. Oh, okay. So Peter's doing the whole book. He, Bryce is just writing the second the second half of the exactly book. right. Okay, now I get it. All right, excellent. Um, well, also, uh, you do a couple great uh, fruit pie ads, or I should say, just snack ads. Uh, yeah. in, in both both the issues that have come out so far. Uh, and those are great. And I love people discover those on their own. But I had to put up uh, this uh, excellent uh, fake ad for those amazing, uh, from the Bronze and Silver Age, uh, yeah. you know, onion gum and the black soap and all those things. But I just, even just the, just the title, Joke Bible. It's like, uh-huh, and it's on fire. So that's fantastic. Yeah, these this is like uh the the comic book uh ads I grew up with as a kid, but yeah. from like sort of a purgatory, uh where <laughs> these you know, these 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 things are sort of based on the things I grew up with, but are much darker vision. Yes, absolutely. But it also yeah. represents my my uh debut as a comic book artist because I drew the artwork on all of these uh these toys. Oh, that's great. It's oh, about all I'm good for, really. Well, they're, they're very good, man. I'm sure you know. Hey, I, I listen. I as a as an art a guy who can never get his art going. It, I'm I'm a horrible artist. Uh, I think you did a great job. Absolutely, the Johnson and Johnson Company, I believe, was their name back in the day. And God only knows whatever happened to that company. You know, yeah. <laughs> I know. <Yeah. laughs> sea monkeys. Uh, all that gross stuff, and of course you've got uh, Wait, the Johnson. And, are you saying that the Johnson and Johnson company made sea monkeys? Well, I don't. Oh, yeah, you're right. So yeah, when they weren't making band aids, they were making sea monkeys. I'm not really sure. That's crazy. No, no, I don't think so. Oh, okay, all right, I'm gullible. <laughs> I forget what the, I thought. Maybe it was Johnson and Murphy. I I thought Johnson was in the name. I don't remember, but, but yeah. yeah I, I, what I do remember is that my parents wouldn't let me send away for anything in those ads because they sort of understood that these are all you know ripoffs. Yeah. But in doing so, they transferred the resentment that I would have felt towards these toys to them instead <laughs> because I resented them for not letting me order sea monkeys. You know, not letting letting me have my own deep sea civilization in my in my bedroom. Uh, but they were right. No, absolutely, man. No, I, and again, I, those ads were just the best. God, I remember they had the Raquel Welch pillow. The Raquel and, Welch pillow. Yes, I yes. remember that. Oh yeah, oh that was enough. Maybe that was only in the Marvel Black and White magazines back in the day. Wow. Yeah, but I did yeah, another oh. one. I did another page of the uh, the toy ads for an upcoming issue, in which I did like the hundred, you know, soldiers for a dollar, but it's like a modern warfare set, so it's all like you know like drones firing hellfire missiles and then just rub it rubble and carnage and people wandering through the dust, you know, absolutely, man. No, that's a, a, you're absolutely right. Those kinds of things. I always wondered if they were like incredibly tiny because no, you know, they had to have been. Yeah. My guess is that they're probably just like little punch out paper. Well, like they said they were plastic. So they're probably yeah. just these really, really tiny, you know, plastic molds, you know, of, I just, uh, a month or so ago, I had a guy on, who didn't do those toys that were advertised in the back of comics, but all the really cheap uh, rack toys that you would get at like, you know, uh, dime stores and the gas station or whatever. And, and would have uh, not only superhero cardboard backing and stuff and the toys never made sense. It'd be like a Spider-Man vehicle and it's, or a Superman vehicle. And yeah. you're like, yeah, they, they don't need vehicles. Oh, that would be the, that would be like the worst experience for Superman to be like stuck in a car in traffic, just thinking if I could just go out the sunroof, I could fly. <laughs> that would be horrifying. Absolutely, man. But yeah, but not only that, but they even had like bad TV tie-ins. So like the Love Boat beauty kit. And it's like, sure, why yeah. not? No, hilarious stuff, man. Very, very funny stuff. And uh, no, these ads, I, again, Figures Ahoy Comics once again they give you more than just the comic itself. Uh, it's it you know you get two stories in there. You get a lot of funny ads. The mailbag is funny. 
uh, everything that's going on and the and the issues are great. Yeah, they really pulled out all the punches for this title. They let us like basically replace all the normal extras from Ahoy, like the in, the house pages and the uh, the the sort of prose pieces they normally do. Yeah, with my bad themed stuff. So it's all sort of in universe. The the toy ads and the uh, the uh, fruit pie ads and stuff all kind of like build on the universe that the comic is in. That's excellent, man. No, it's uh, it's great. And again um a, a great example of a, a company i mean I, i'm glad that you guys have all found each other and stuff but really tom pyre and company they just have a lot of really terrific comedy comics and it's man it's such a relief i mean i i noticed dc put out a mad magazine this week i know a lot of it is reprint material unfortunately and so thank god you guys kind of picked up the slack and and are doing comedy comics i hope these things are finding the audience and, and well, i hope to that, be okay that's be. great which is good. And I think part of it is, yeah, there's still like a lot of people out there who want to read funny comics. It's kind of like, you know, announcing to the world that you have, you know, leprosy. If you're saying I'm, I'm doing a, a funny comic, but there are people out there who really like him, even though it seems kind of like you say that to a publisher and they're like, ooh, we're not we're not touching that. No, and, and I understand. Yeah, but again, there, we'll do it. But that's that's where. I think uh, there is room for these other publishers to do superhero comics if they take your point of view and um, and make fun of themselves and stuff. And that's why, I, hey, man, that's awesome that DC is is cool with One Star Squadron. And I hope to hell that it, that it sells because, again, they have the pantheon of heroes that, uh, yeah, it'd be great. Man, if somebody would, – would you want to do an Inferior 5 book – or is that too obvious? Are they too obvious in terms of? No, I, I would I would do any any book any title that I actually have a good idea for. I'm not picky. Okay. What I really want to do is just find characters and, and uh, premises that um, allow me to talk about the sorts of things I want to talk about and tell stories that I think are good. I don't really, you know, like I did the Flintstones, not really caring about, not being a huge fan of the Flintstones, but 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 wanting to talk about what I saw as like the fundamental flaw of, the, of, of flaws of civilization, and that was just the gateway to do it well in fact uh you even have uh when you depict the water buffaloes in your flintstones book uh some of the cavemen have post-traumatic stress disorders as mm -hmm. well and frankly when i was reading about gangbuster it, it did to me call back to what you were doing in the flintstones yeah and what i think it all sort of relates to is like uh what i what, what sort of i think compels me to talk about this sort of thing is is how disposable we all are to our institutions and really, it should be the other way around. It's like the institutions should be the ones worried about us disposing of them when they're no longer useful to us. But somewhere along the line, it got switched. And our purpose in life has become to be useful to these institutions. And when we're not, then we're the ones discarded. Whereas if, if the you know governments and uh, the, the different human institutions we create, religions and whatnot, are not there to make life easier for human beings, then what good are they? A hundred percent, man. And, and again, um, I know that you started as a novelist and I'm, and, um, I, are you finding more satisfaction doing the comics? Yeah, um, I think, I think my, my voice resonates more naturally in comics. I'm a very sort of visual thinker, but I hate writing visuals in prose. And so yeah. comics is like perfect because someone else takes all that stuff away from me and just allows me to like, you know, craft liners, but one liners and like, like concepts but uh but yeah I, I think that that you know i i was really just sort of a writer in search of a of a medium and comics is like a medium that works really well i think for the way i i imagine stories well specifically uh, with in the case of peter kraus who did his own dark uh superman with mark mark wade irredeemable and that right. um one of my favorite superhero comics of all time so with you. Absolutely, man. No, and finally had Peter on last year and should have him on again to talk about my bad. Um, do do uh does he and forgive me, who's your artist on one star on one star squadron? Uh Steve Lieber. Oh, of course it is. The well, immortal Jesus Steve and... Lieber. Yeah, I have real no. good luck with Steve's. Uh I had Steve Pugh on the Flintstones and Stephen Byrne on Wonder Twins, and now <laughs> Steve Lieber for one star squadron that's my professional advice well you know at some point work with the steve work with steves absolutely i respect that that's great that's my that's the of course the uh, punchline of my favorite clean joke about and, and a million different names can be used but when the grasshopper walks into the bar and, and the, the bartender says you know we got a drink named after you 
and the grasshopper says, you've got a drink named Steve, you know, so, you know, and you got to do the goofy voice to really say right. all this. Uh, kids love it. That's a great four-year-old joke. So anyway, uh, but I was going to say, obviously in the case of Lieber, and I did see that Steve drew one star squadron as well, but Steven and Pete, are they contributing jokes? Uh, yeah, yeah. Steve throws a bunch of things in the background. Like sometimes we had a great time, like, cause he, I, uh, I have a scene where they're pointing to a list of other sort of superhero apps. It's so like Steve and I each came up with like four different superhero <laughs> apps. Uh, like uh, one's called, I think it's one Steve came up with called app app in a way. And I, I came up with one called Kryptonite. tonight. Like you can get a Kryptonian tonight. Uh, and so, yeah, like things like that, we were very collaborative on and, and yeah, I wanted to like leave the door open for a lot of Steve's creativity. Cause he's a super funny guy. That's that, and I know he's local too. I don't know if yeah. uh, you guys are able to sit down and, and get uh, within distance of each other. And yes, then... we uh, at the beginning of the series we got we both live in Portland, so we got together some for some amazing Portland sandwiches. Uh, I you know I, people like to diss on Portland, but I have yet to eat a better sandwich than I have here right here in town. I have yet to find better food carts than I have here right in town. It's oh, yeah. it's like a utopia for people who don't want to who don't like have a ton of money to spend on like upscale dining. Uh, so uh, I, I'm okay if they laugh at us as long as they don't come and, and clog up the lines to the food carts. When, uh, when I came in for Rose city in 2019 and I, and I, I, I stayed with Brian, I stayed with the Venices and, and I'm like, Hey, I'm going to do the mother in law thing. I'm going to be here for five days. And I'm like, no problem, yeah. man. It's cool. And I made sure that I spent a day with, uh, with Steve and Jeff Parker at Helioscope. And oh yeah, man! No, we took full advantage oh, of the food trucks. Right Heliosup is just like an amazing atmosphere for comic book writers and artists. It's like uh, you know, just a, and I think this is you know, I read somewhere that this is why people move to cities to be in close proximity to, to interesting people. Uh, that that's basically what you why you pay higher rent to live in a city as opposed to like you know East Stop Sign Nebraska or something. And in the case of Heliosup, it's a, it's it's a, a proof and it's proof a case in point. Uh, it, it, it's like, there's so much collaboration and just so many like cool ideas and, and artists and writers just sort of working together. Uh, it's, it, it, it really is sort of, I think what I imagined things being like when I, when I moved here in the nineties. Oh, that's great to hear. And absolutely, man. No, I, uh, I, I, I always say if I had money to burn, I'd, I'd move to Portland because literally I could think of a dozen people that I'm either good friends with or good acquaintances with just off the top of my head and then continuing to meet people like yourself and getting to know Lieber better and so many others. Uh, yeah. And then also I would say Chicago is very much like that too. In fact, uh, one of the panels that I'm on on uh, Friday at C2E2 is about Chicago's comic culture. And I was really pleased that Chris Arant like reached out to me and was like, Hey, do you want to be on this and represent comic journalism, which as we know is an oxymoron. And also I even, I always say I'm a small J journalist. I'm not Woodward or Bernstein. I don't give a shit about learning when a book is, you know, first exclusive. Yeah, that's great. But no, I, and I, and I mean, really the line absolutely dissolves. I kind of think of myself as like comics, Johnny Carson and him where Johnny moved the show to LA. He's hanging out with all the, uh, the movie and TV people that he always wanted to and stuff. Yeah. And that's truly, I mean, I, I've, I've grown to be good friends with the Mike Norton's and Tim Seeley's and, uh, you know, Jenny Frizens and people like that, that, um, yeah, I mean, and we all have the same interests, so we all hang out and, uh, yeah, I mean, well, pre COVID of course, but, uh, no, it's, uh, you're right. It's, it's great to be in a city where it has this kind of really interesting, diverse community and stuff. Right. You can, whatever you're into, you can find the people that are into the same thing and, you know, it just makes life a hundred percent more interesting. Absolutely. Uh, one of the things I love about Chicago too, is that it's like this great combination of like high art and, and and low art where you know it's like got some of the most amazing architecture in the world it's got the art institute of chicago which is for my money the finest you know art museum in the world and uh and, and yet you, you can go across the street and have like the greasiest like chicago style pizza you've ever had in your life or you know bratwurst for lunch you know it, it's just an amazing <laughs> city for uh, to appeal to the whole spectrum of taste and class, you know, you're right. No, you're a hundred percent right. And I, the, the mo about five, well, Jesus, now it's been seven years since I moved back to the city and I'm like, yeah, man, I missed, I just missed that, 
that vibe and everything. When I was in uh, Chicago radio in the 90s, I was living in the burbs, but really spending most of my time in the city uh, when I worked at the rock station and stuff. And now I get that same vibe from my comic art friends. And uh, and yeah, it's it's wonderful being back and just the live the live stages that, that are around me, even my direct neighborhood and stuff. I'm I'm very fortunate uh, being here back in Chicago and stuff and back in the city. It's amazing. Um, uh, one of the, I want to answer one of the questions I see in the comments about uh, obscure characters. Uh, yes, who's an under the radar Marvel uh, character you'd like to take a stab at? And for me, and I think I've said this before on your show, it would be it would be Howard the Duck. That's a natural for you, man. Absolutely. Yeah. And hopefully Howard rubbing up against the rest of the Marvel Universe and stuff and having conversations with Doctor Strange or Iron Man. Yeah, I think I'd love to do a series about him like being a journalist and talking to these these characters, like interviewing them for his uh for his podcast or magazine or whatever. That's outstanding. Oh my god, that'd be that really would be great. I hope Howard the Duck podcast. I think that's that's the pitch. No, I'm for it. Absolutely. You know, and they've, I have to say, Zdarsky did a great job with his Howard the Duck uh, series. I really think, and then thank God Gerber got to do a, a last one before he passed away. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I really, I do think that in the 2000s, Marvel has been smart and, and chosen wisely. Well, you're in Marvel right now. Oh, by the way, here, Bruce uh, loves the uh, journalism angle. And yes, we all hope you get to do it, man. That would be amazing. Uh, but also, you're wrapping up. Uh, did I get grab the wire? There we go. Fantastic Four uh, life stories. Uh, is this is this your book or is this somebody else's book? That's mine. Okay, that is that's what you've yes, got. Good, uh, the 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 life story. Yeah, that's, what, that's story. what you're showing. That's what you're showing yes. right now. Yeah, Fantastic man. Four life story is mine, and we're on issue five. Just came out today. Five of six, so it wraps up next month. But I, this is sort of the climax of the series. I'm excited, man. No, it's. It's been a great story. I, I have not read today's issue yet. Uh, I'm certainly looking forward to one more. But um, that just shows the range of your muscles, Mark, because, again, you're you're absolutely killing it on uh, the comedy comics. But it, I'm really glad you're getting the opportunity to write straight-up superhero stuff as well. And, uh, you know, I mean, obviously, uh, uh, life stories is, is just like the uh, Chip Zdarsky Spider-Man life stories and stuff, uh, not quite continuity, but certainly in the in the vein of of you know great marvel moments and stuff i i, I love it i think it's amazing well, thank you yeah yeah you know and i i i uh i don't think of i think of myself as a writer first you know i know that that i gravitate towards satire and comedy and that's kind of what i'm known for but i really just want to to be a writer and writers as writers you appeal to the whole breadth of human emotions and and uh, human thought and so i really want to like make sure i'm doing something that's you know, not safe for me. That's something that forces me to exercise muscles that otherwise would atrophy because I feel like that's what sort of keeps you fresh and alive as, a, as an artist. I respect that. Who among the Fantastic Four did you have uh, trouble with or was the most difficult to write? Or were they all like, no, I know these people, no problem. I think Johnny for me was the most difficult to write. But what I did was I... I sort of like came up with like this one sentence that I thought sort of encapsulated the, the, the soul of each character. And I just sort of built the way I treated each character around that. And to me, it was like uh, any, the, the soul of any good character is about basically about what they want. And I think for Reed, he wants to save the world more than anything. And, and, uh, and Sue wants to change the world. And uh, uh, Johnny wants to party. Uh, and then wants the love he feels was denied him. But, you know, I use those motivations basically to inform, uh, I built the whole story of these characters and the relationships around those you know, four basic truths about the characters. Does this make you want to write more Fantastic Four? I would love to write more Fantastic Four. They've always been one of my, my favorites. And, I, you know, because they have the, the, the more serious science fiction angle than a lot of superhero comics. Yeah. And I love the fact that they've got such four unique and different voices that you can, that the approach life, it's sort of like the, uh, the, the blind men all feeling the elephant and to one feeling the trunk, it's a long slender thing for the one feeling a tail. It's like a snake. And uh, you know, I, I feel like the fantastic four are like that. They're just sort of like approaching the elephant from different angles. 
That's great. That's amazing. Have you discussed and and not only just the Fantastic Four, but Superman and other characters? Have you discussed your thoughts on the characters with other comic book writers? Yeah, I think you know it's it's, it's the sort of thing that comes up with just when you're natural conversation with other writers at like conventions and stuff, or or via email and stuff. And it, it, it's kind of fun to to hear other people's takes and what and what, or just to sort of like riff on things ideas you were having <coughs> that would never fly in a million years but no i hear and i hear what you're saying i'm covering while you're trying to get a drink there thank but, you I'm a little coffee oh no no hey man <laughs> no, 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 i got i got my spin drift i'm uh, i'm i'm prepared don't sweat it <laughs> um no that's great are uh who are your comic book friends other creators and stuff uh, I like uh, Bendis a lot. Like uh, I, I like talking to him, and he's been real not only just a friend, but like also kind of a, kind of a mentor. Uh, and um, my friend Bryce, who I mentioned earlier, who I co-wrote My Bad with, I talked to him. I run a lot of my ideas by him. And also, like we mentioned, Jeff Parker and Steve Lieber and uh, Amy Chu uh, has oh, been yeah. really really good to me. Cool. Got in comics, so yeah, I've I've got a little posse of people who are really uh helpful and I, I just admire as creators all of whom you know know more about the craft than i do well i'm, I'm glad that they're willing to share and then as you say it doesn't surprise me uh the mentorship uh relationship that you have with brian i know he does that with a lot of great creators i'm really glad that he brought you got you in for uh wonder twins yeah uh, me too. Uh, wonder comics and everything and i thought that was another series that i wish had gotten a little more time and a little more love uh, well, but it, it anyway. got 12 issues for for me is like an eternity. It's like, wow, 12 issues. <laughs> uh, also, you know, working with Kurt Busick on um, on Marvel Snapshots, I learned a lot from him because he's like, you know, a master. And, uh, oh, yeah. And just like going back and forth on the script with him, just like emailing back and forth. It's like, oh, this is how – that's when it finally occurred to me. Like, I, I didn't really know how to make a comic book until I talked to this guy. That's awesome. I would imagine Tom Pyre and the Ahoy guys are awesome. Yeah, Tom is great. Uh, yeah, and and Sarah over there at at, a, at Ahoy is. I mean, yeah, it's, it's like there's so many people that I've just been able to like bounce ideas off. Uh, Marie Javens is probably my biggest mentor. She's the one oh, who discovered great. me, uh, gave me a comic book career, and also you know saved me from myself many times early on when I didn't really know what I was doing. So she's probably the one who's crafted me and like helped me survive my you know my infancy as a comic book writer more than anyone. And that doesn't surprise me. And also, I finally started connecting the dots of what Marie was doing before she became a uh, publisher or editor in chief. I, I forget what her specific She's role. Editor in chief right now. Okay. But um, yeah, I, I met her through uh, Shannon Wheeler, who's also a great friend and a great sort of indie artist who does too much Copy Man and cartoons for the New Yorker. Yep. And we did a book together called God is Disappointing You, which is kind of like this my. <laughs> my first foray into comics and, and he's like just like a really imaginative really witty guy and and like he's another great person in portland here that i can bounce ideas off of and stuff there you go absolutely man. no he's uh, uh he's been on the show a few times and i've uh had good face-to-face -face time with him at uh, in the after hours of conventions and stuff yeah i like yeah, that. I like no. great great sense of humor great and sense he knows of humor. everyone he knows absolutely everyone in the industry it's crazy well you know too much coffee man hell that goes back at least to the 90s yeah yeah i remember reading that that's what you know it kind of struck me as kind of how how weird it is that we sort of struck up this friendship and start working together because i remember reading those in college you know absolutely man no that was like whenever those started coming out i'm like oh that's that sounds funny i need to check this out and yeah man he's just like um the guy who created Mystery Men and uh, Flaming Carrot and stuff like that, Bob uh, and I forget. Bob Bob's Burton. Name. Yeah, oh, Bob, I love yes. Bob Burton. Absolutely, man. No, you know it's we need that in comics, and that's why I'm glad Shannon is still around doing it. You, Lieber, Kraus, uh, obviously, you guys know what you're doing. Your buddy uh, Bryce as well. What's what and right, Bryce isn't that his name? Yeah. What what else? What else has Bryce done uh, beyond? Uh, uh, cool. He hasn't written a lot of comics. He wrote a, uh, a, mi a mini series with me called Killing Red Sonia, uh, which is sort of an offshoot of the main Red Sonia title that, that I was writing at the time. But uh, I think my bad is really something that's allowed him to sort of flower and, and like really lean on his like natural sort of comedic talent. Uh, agreed, man. No, this is a really great new series. It's only two issues in. 
Uh, everybody has to jump on and check that out as well. Now, here from Vault, of course, we talked about this last time, Deadbox. Um, has that wrapped up? No. It's on a little bit of hiatus, okay. uh, but 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 there is more coming. Okay, great. And, uh, yeah, that's kind of a horror parody of uh, Redbox and everything. And uh, uh, another another great idea of yours, man. No, it's – Thanks. Hey, seriously, Mark, honestly, uh, I, I'm always excited when I see something new from you. And uh, and and it, it, it has yet to disappoint. So I, I congratulate you on, on the run you've got going. And uh, and I'm glad that other people are aware and, and chiming in. But really, man, you're, you're stretching all your muscles and I think being very effective and stuff. Do you I don't know what you can tease about what's coming up. I have a, an unannounced book from DC with, with Mike Allred. Wow. Great. Well, I'm that could be very, even... very happy about this. This is something I, th- I, I, I really would like to talk about, but I can't say more. All right. No problem, man. No, that's great. And again, Allred's, well, it could be fun silver age stuff, or it could be irreverent. God only knows. I mean, we all know, uh, Allred, of course, uh, gave us the, uh, the bat to see, uh, Batman, Adam West kind of thing among, and not only that, but also X-Force and, so many other great books over the years. So I, I think that's uh, that's wonderful that you're working with Mike. I, I, I think it will be a unique project. I'm very excited. Do we know when that's going to be announced, Ballparkish? I have no idea. Okay, all right. Uh, he's he he's deep into it, so I'm hoping it will be announced soon. Okay. Oh, here's some uh, nice comments from Sarah about Deadbox. Um, hold on. There we go. I love the story within a story format of Deadbox. A fantastic blending of comic book and pulp short story writing styles must be fun to dip into a different genre per issue. Yes, it's it's very much about both sort of the milieu that I grew up in as a kid and also the love of movies that I discovered as a kid as a way to escape it. And so, yeah, it's, it's really about creating like uh, these different genres of movies that were that would never be made but which sort of underscore the other part of the plot, which is a unique kind of storytelling that uh, I normally wouldn't be allowed to do. Understood. Pardon me, Sala. I said Sarah. Sala made that comment and uh, also is very excited about your uh, all red tea. So that's cool. Um, no, man, I hear you. Are uh, You know, I already know as, a, as an old movie fan and stuff, have you seen anything fun lately? Yeah, uh, I went and saw Last Night in Soho uh, recently. Which How I is it? I, I still haven't seen it. Is it. Does it live up to the hype? It's pretty good. Um, although I, I think probably my uh, uh, my favorite movie this year probably was, was Green Knight, if I had to like pick one. Cool. That's cool. Yeah, no, I'm a, I, I, I hope for the best when it comes to Knight and uh, Knight in Shining Armor uh, movies and stuff. Um, but uh, no, that's good to hear about Green Knight. How about any old movies? Are you an old movie guy? You are. Oh movie yeah, guy. yeah, I love old movies. Um, I'm trying to think of one that I've seen recently that really stood out for me. Uh, there, there is kind of a, a cool but sort of corny noir I watched recently called Kansas City Confidential, uh, which might be worth checking out. But one of the things that. that you know that I, that I I think the post Squid Game you know world is like allowed. <laughs> us to do is be exposed to more sort of Asian TV shows. Absolutely. And uh, I've seen some really great ones. I mean, other than Squid Game, which I love, there was uh, um, Hellbound, another Korean series about people who are approached by some supernatural figure and told that they're going to go to hell at a specific time and date in the future. And it completely turns the world upside down. And that's a series worth checking out. Also, there's a great Japanese series uh, it's similarly themed in Squid Game because it's about like a deadly game show, but it's you know more about the puzzles themselves than it is about the social commentary. And it was called uh, Alice in Borderland, and I recommend that as well. Both really well done series. So I feel like you know the more we sort of like include the the TV and movies of these other cultures that we normally wouldn't get access to, it's like it's just like finding a room in the house that you never knew existed. I agree. Absolutely agree, and and uh, yeah, and not only the Asian product, but also God, uh, Spain, Spain, and and the Netherlands. Uh, yeah, yeah, I I love that uh, all the streamers are really cherry picking some of the best uh, international television to and film to expose to us. And yeah, man, it's and HBO is even doing it as well. 
Yeah. Uh, so yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree with all of that. Um, you know, when I watched uh, Sunday night, uh, they did the first part of it on epics. Uh, I'm big on music documentaries and especially ones of, of rock and roll. And it's uh, all about the uh, beginnings of a and records. And the A was Herb Alpert and the trumpet player. And uh, the M was Jerry Moss. And from their form, it, it basically went from the formation to the early 70s. And I imagine part two will take us up to the modern era or whatever. But I love that. And yeah, I really love it. Fascinating. It's, What's it's, that called? It's called uh, The Story of A&M. Mr. Okay. Mr. A and Mr. M, The Story of A&M. That was on, that's on Epics, that cable channel. And then also Turner over uh, Thanksgiving showed uh, a great Dean Martin documentary called Dean Martin, King of Cool. And that was incredible. That was fantastic because it really reminded everybody, yeah, you know, cheese ball in a lot of ways or whatever. But uh, really, for about 10 or 15 years, made a hell of a lot of really great movies. Uh, Young they Lions. made a, a Dean Martin, Jerry, Lee, Jerry Lewis comic book over at D.C., I, I saw them archived when I went to the like the DC sort of um, library. Yep, you are correct. And in fact, uh, when the split happened, it just became the solo Jerry Lewis comic. Yeah, and it ran until uh, either the very late sixties or the very early seventies. I mean, it, it ran a really long. And in fact, uh, the great Neil Adams even drew it because wow. he could no draw idea. in a cartoony style and turn in like ten pages a week, you know, uh, because he could draw so fast and stuff. So he even was doing it for, for a good while. There was also even a Bob Hope comic from DC that made it to the early 70s. Yeah. And man, boy, there's a character that you should uh, uh, play with. Uh, Resurrect Bob Hope comics. Well, his his superhero persona, and I can't even remember what he was called. Super cool, super something. And he had this like weird hippie wig that he would wear. And then he had the like kind of classic Superman looking suit. But it, insane. So yeah, that's uh, you know he maybe they should show up and uh, and be in one star squadron. I don't know. Yeah, um, and to answer Sala's question, uh, I've seen the first segment of the Get Back documentary, but I'm, I'm enjoying it. And I look forward to the rest. Yeah, you know, I really think for people, and I'll include myself in this, that that um, are fast that are creative themselves, but are fascinated by the creative process. Um, I can because I've talked to friends who are casual Beatle fans. And they're like, yeah, you know, all right, you know, enough, you know, do we need to saw, see Paul work out every every bit of get back? And it's like, yes, we do, because yeah, that's, that's the genius. The fact of that you don't that. see the process, you never see the process from beginning to end is kind of what makes it unique. It's kind of what makes this documentary worth watching. I so agree. And also, um, I won't reveal. Here's one. Here's the secret project I have, uh, and and I and I put two and two together, and thank God it's working. A friend of mine did a lot of great interviews. Uh, in a specific genre, but he did them as print interviews. So he would put his micro cassette up to the phone receiver and, uh, and uh, you know, talk to the person on the other side and his central air would kick in and all this background noise. And, and it just sounded like hell. And I heard Peter Jackson and the others who worked on the get back documentary um, talk about um, the, uh, the process of, uh, of, of the AI that they used to single out the Beatles' voices when they were all muddled and stuff, and now we've got clear cuts. And I'm like, maybe I can do that with my friend's uh, audio. And sure yeah. enough, I could. And it's a, wow. it's a yeah, I'm I'm blown away. Brave new world. It's kind of like when they discovered DNA evidence, and then all the serial killers who thought they'd gotten away with it were like, what? <laughs> they awesome they comparison. Find right? me based on what? See, there you go, folks. That's where the brain is. That's why he writes the stories that he does. That's fantastic, man. I don't disagree with you. So, yeah. Dude, awesome stuff. Here, let's see. What is uh, – Casey says there's a fantastic movie series on Netflix about a series of interactions that take place in an all-night uh, noodle house. Oh, yeah, that sure. sounds good. I would watch well, that. Do you, ever, do you remember from uh, – I don't remember. I think it was from the early 90s. Great Japanese movie, uh, Tampopo. I don't think I've ever seen Tampopo. I've heard I've heard it was great though. It's fantastic. And yeah, it's a that's a great Japanese movie that takes place at a noodle stand and stuff. So, uh there you go, okay. See, uh, I'll, I'll I'll give you one as you give us one. So that's wonderful. Mark as always, uh great conversation. I really appreciate it. And uh man, I am so glad that uh, you found comics and and the comic publishers have found you and are giving you these amazing opportunities with Great books like My Bad, Issue 2 out this week, 
And uh, of course, we had All Star Squad, One Star Squadron, excuse me, uh, that debuted this week as well. Plus, uh, this week issue five of Fantastic Four Life Stories, and uh, we look forward to more of uh, Dead Box coming up from Vault and uh, whatever else you got coming. And of course, uh, uh, Not All Robots, uh, second arc already guaranteed in the book. So uh, more of Not All Robots on the way from AWA. Well done, dude. Thanks. Thanks for having me on, John. As always, no, really appreciate it, man. Um, I believe. That's it for uh, recordings for this week for Word Balloon because I'm going to be busy with C2E2 starting tomorrow. So I do have stuff in the can to still release and uh, look, looking forward to sharing with everybody. No Kinescope tomorrow night. That's my live television show that we discuss, uh, Mark, with uh, with Jeff Parker and uh, Gabe Hardman and uh, Ian Brill. But we're not going to do it this week. We'll do it next week. And uh, I'm going to have to wait and uh, yell at uh, new Star Trek uh, for a week so everybody gets a break. From hearing me complain about new Star Trek. So and thanks bad. to Casey for looking up the title of that movie, uh, Midnight Diner Tokyo Stories. Oh, there you go. Yes, indeed. Yes, thank you, man. Boom. All right. We've we've got it in our must uh what must watch list. Thanks everybody for watching and uh take care of yourselves. All, all of you be good. And uh we'll we'll talk next time on uh Word Balloon Live. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.